first I looked, and there was a great crowd that no one could number. They were from every nation, tribe, people, and language. They were standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They wore white robes and held palm branches in their hands, and they cried out with a loud voice, Victory belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. All the angels stood in a circle around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. They fell face down before the throne and worshiped God saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and always. Amen. Then one of the elders said to me, Who are these people wearing white robes, and where did they come from? I said to him, Sir, you know. And then he said to me, These people have come out of great hardship. They have washed their robes and made them white in the Lamb's blood. This is the reason they are before God's throne. They worship him day and night in his temple, and the one seated on the throne will shelter them. They won't hunger or thirst anymore. No sun or scorching heat will beat down on them, because the lamb who is in the midst of the throne will shepherd them. He will lead them to the springs of life-giving water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Our second scripture reading this morning comes from the Gospel of Luke, starting at chapter 6, verse 20. Jesus raised his eyes to his disciples and said, Happy are you who are poor, because God's kingdom is yours. Happy are you who hunger now, because you will be satisfied. Happy are you who weep now, because you will laugh. Happy are you when people hate you and reject you and insult you and condemn your name as evil because of the human one. Rejoice when that happens. Leap for joy because you have a great reward in heaven. Their ancestors did the same things to the prophets. But how terrible for you who are rich, because you have already received your comfort. And how terrible for you who have plenty now, because you will be hungry. How terrible for you who laugh now, because you will mourn and weep. How terrible for you when all speak well of you. Their ancestors did the same things to the false prophets. But I say to you who are willing to hear, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you and bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. If someone slaps you on the cheek, offer the other one as well. And if someone takes your coat, don't with her hold your shirt either. Give to everyone who asks and don't demand your things back from those who take them. Treat people in the same way that you want them to treat you. This is the word of the Lord. The Lord What language is spoken in heaven? You ever think about that? We have this understanding of this great communion of saints, and when we all get to heaven, there's going to be this great time of togetherness where we're all joined together and uh, living together, working together, if that's what we do in heaven, or as we see in Revelation, singing and praising God around the throne together. And yet it also says right here that this great multitude 
is from every nation, tribe, people, and language. If they don't speak the same language, how do they do everything together? How do they get along? So I find myself wondering sometimes, what language is spoken in heaven? Is there some great heavenly language that we all just suddenly know when we cross over that divide? Or, or is it more like Pentecost? Remember Pentecost when everyone heard what was said in their own language? As if the Holy Spirit is this great master translator, you know, universal translator? Is that what it is? Well, the truth of the matter is I may ask the question, but I don't spend too much time worrying about it because I know that God has it well in hand. I don't know exactly what everything's going to be like in heaven, and I don't know exactly how this great communion of saints gathered around the throne works, but I trust it does. That God has ensured that it does. And I don't have to worry about it. Which only begs the question, what about here on earth? Because we believe that the communion of saints is not just a bunch of people gathered around the throne of God in heaven, but it is here and it is now and it is you and it is me, as well as those who have gone on before us to that church triumphant. This is referred to in Revelation as the great hardship. Those that have gone on have come out of the great hardship what about the communion of saints that is still here in the great hardship? We too are also from every nation, tribe, people, and language. And believe me, there's a lot of people I can't talk to in this world because I don't know their language. How is this great communion of saints supposed to work here on earth, here in the great hardship where we can't communicate? And in fact, even when we think we know each other's language, we still get it wrong. In the year 2000, the United Methodist denomination did a great act of reconciliation, and we invited back into the fold the African-American brothers and sisters we had driven out years before. We invited back in the AME Church, those people who had been taken from their kneeling in prayer in their church in Philadelphia and forced out because of the color of their skin. We invited back in the African American Episcopal Zion Church, AME Zion Church, who had a similar experience in New York. We invited back into communion the CME Church, which white segregationists had named the Colored Methodist Episcopal Church. Thank goodness they were wise enough to change the name. We did this great act of reconciliation and invited people back into communion with us, welcomed back into the Methodist fold back in 2000. And in 2002, we reenacted that in our own annual conference. And I was there at that service. And some of the people from the great historic African American churches in downtown Phoenix came to the convention center in Mesa where we all gathered together in worship and our mass choir sang and their choir sang and we worshiped together and we acted like the communion of saints should act, or at least that's what we thought. And then the bishop said, that we, as the host, you know, it was like our spiritual home, annual conference, that we should go and welcome all of our guests, all these African-American guests. And I went out to greet some of the people who had come from these various churches downtown, and I turned around to go back to my seat only to discover that members of this annual conference were greeting their own African-American pastors as if they didn't belong here. Thank you for being with us today. Welcome to our fold. 
I knew that one pastor I'd been sitting with. I knew he'd been a part of this denomination, this annual conference for many years. And I just didn't know how to act. But that's not the only incident that happens in church. That's not the only example. More recently, I was at a meeting of the Board of Ordained Ministry, and we were talking about a need for greater diversity among the clergy. If we want to appeal to a greater number of people out in the world around us, we have to have more diverse clergy who can relate to them, who can understand them, who can bring the faith to those that some of us don't relate to. And so we had this great conversation about diversity and making people feel comfortable. And then later after the conversation had moved on, someone used the phrase, well, I'm just the low man on the totem pole around here. And fortunately, one of our Native American clergy said, uh, excuse me, but since we were talking about diversity and understanding each other's cultures, do you understand how offensive that phrase is? It's common here in the United States, isn't it? But to a Native American, the low person on the totem pole is the most important person, the greatest person. They are the strongest and best persons that support all that goes above. They deserve the most respect and they are the most honored and that is the most honored place to be on the totem pole. We all learned a little something that day. But if we, we who are in the great communion of saints, we who are trying to do things right, we who are trying to be open and welcoming and understanding, if we can still get it wrong, what hope is there for the rest of us, for this world, for this great hardship? And maybe that's why I found our gospel lesson so attractive today. Because there are important lessons contained in this message from Luke. Important lessons about how we, the communion of saints, need to be getting along with each other. And Jesus raised his eyes to his disciples and said, Happy are you who are poor because God's kingdom is yours. Is yours. Here. Now. Jesus is not preaching pie in the sky in the great by and by. It's you, you who are disenfranchised, you who are poor and powerless, you who are looked down upon, you who people look through and don't even look at. You are inheritors of the kingdom of God. You are children of God. You are part of the kingdom here and now. No one can take your inheritance so hold your head up, for you are a child of God, no matter how you are treated in the great hardship. But he goes on. Happy are you who hunger now, because you will be satisfied. Once again, I have to wonder, is this pie in the sky in the great by and by? You will be satisfied. But I just do not think that is what Jesus is talking about. If you, if everyone we meet is part of the kingdom here and now, is our brother and sister in Christ and inheritors of that kingdom with us now, then it is up to us to actually look at them and see them and see their suffering and feed them. Happy are you who hunger now because you will be satisfied, because you are a member of the kingdom. You are an inheritor of God's kingdom. You are a child of God, and someone else who is a child of God should notice. And you will be fed. Happy are you who weep now because you will laugh. Once again, because 
even though you want to crawl away into some private spot and suffer and grieve, don't do that. There's a whole communion of saints here who understand your grief and they will be there for you and you can cry on their shoulder and someday you will all laugh together. Happy are you who weep now because your brothers and sisters here, here in the great hardship, get it. And they're going to be there for you. Happy are you when people hate you, reject you, insult you, condemn your name as evil because of God, because of your faith in Jesus Christ. We can be really nasty to each other here in the great hardship. We not only understand each other, we can be really mean. I have been called Satan. My children have been called devil spawn by church members. Not here. Don't worry. Not here. <laughs> but we know how to be mean and cruel, how to reject and insult and condemn each other. But there are those that still insist on doing God's will. I was trying to figure it out, it had to be at least 10 years ago, if not more, that I went on the bishop's walk in the desert. This is when immigration issues, people coming over the border from Mexico illegally, was really starting to become a big deal. And so the bishop sponsored an event to go down to Tucson, to go down to the border, to try to find out and understand what was going on and why so many people were crossing illegally. And one of the presentations we had was from Humane Borders. And Humane Borders told us how the coyotes who make money off of these poor people trying to come to what they consider to be the promised land. Yes, the United States is still considered to be the promised land by many people. But these coyotes feed off of people's poverty and fear and desire for a better life. And they take all their wealth, all their physical goods, whatever it is, to take them across the border and they give them these maps that are fake. Oh yeah, they show basically where things are, but they tell them the distances are not what they are. They tell them that they can walk from the border to Tucson in two hours and they can make it to Phoenix in three or four. Any of you want to try that? They do this to convince them to give up all their physical goods and wealth so that the coyotes can take them across the border and dump them, and who cares whether they live or die. So Humane Borders printed up correct maps with the correct distances and the correct time it would take to walk that far. And Humane Borders was condemned and threatened with violent acts and even death if they did not quit telling people how to get to our country. They were already coming to our country fooled by these fake maps. But Humane Borders, trying to stand up for people's rights to live and to know the truth that it was not easy to get into this country via the border, they had to give up, recall those maps because of the threats of violence. Blessed are you when people reject you and insult you and threaten you for my sake because such they did to the prophets before you. Oh, if we would only listen sometimes to the current prophets of our world. No, this is the great hardship and we don't always get along, and we don't understand each other. And face it, we've got an election in two days, and we're all sick and tired of the violent rhetoric out there, aren't we? Yes. Yeah. And who knows if it's going to be any better come Wednesday. we got to pray hard, people. we got to pray hard. But Jesus gives us a way right here. 
because he goes on from these lessons about learning to see our brothers and sisters to tell us, but I tell you, who are willing to hear, notice he understands not everyone's willing to listen, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who mistreat you. And there I have my answer. Because the language of heaven is not some funky thing that we all learn when we cross over. It's not even the Holy Spirit interpreting for us. The language of heaven is love and it is one that we can speak here on earth. In spite of our differences, in spite of the fact that we're from many nations and many tribes and many races and we speak different languages and we don't always understand each other and we don't always get along. If we do this, if we love enough, then the kingdom of God exists here on earth and the communion of saints exists as well. Give to everyone who asks and don't demand your things back from those who take them. Treat people the same way that you want them to treat you. It is the language of love that we can speak. It is the language of love that brings us together. And it is the language of love that makes the communion of saints and the kingdom of God real here in this world. One of the great things about being a pastor back east is there's all these historical areas and our churches are pretty old and historical too. And, and so we get interesting visitors sometime in church and one Sunday my small church had two young men with backpacks and they were hiking around the United States and they saw this old historic church and decided to come and worship with us. They spoke no English, we think they were Dutch. We're not sure. And they sat there through that whole service. They picked up the hymnals and they matched numbers. They could read that, but they couldn't read the words. And they couldn't sing along. And they didn't understand a word of the sermon, but they sat there through the whole thing. But at the end of the service, we happened to be having communion that day. And in that particular church, when I got there, there were seven people. That was it. What, have we got a row of seven out here? Yeah, you would be it, okay? And, and so their tradition for communion was they would come up and they would kneel at this small altar rail and, and, and they'd receive communion, you know, I'd give it to them. Well, as we grew and we did grow, they started crowding the altar rail and some of them knelt on the floor on the ends. Well, we kept growing, and pretty soon we had people kneeling and people standing behind, and so you would serve communion like this, <laughs> you know, because they were not going to give up being a small church and all gathering together and receiving communion at one time in one place. And so on that particular Sunday, they go back and they grab these two young men, and they bring them forward, and they all stand around and kneel with us at the altar. And those two young men received communion with our church. And when they left, we received hugs. Because the language of communion spoke to them. The language of love offered by Jesus Christ in his body and his very blood spoke to them. And they understood. And if they didn't know anything else about our church, they knew that they were welcome, and they were loved, and they were one with us, even though we couldn't communicate at all. The language of heaven is a language of love, and it transcends all the hardship here on earth, and it connects us to our loved ones in the great, the great throne room, that great heavenly place of worship and praise and joy. We still know tears, we still know hardship, but God has given them life. God has taken away every tear, but God has also given us love to provide for life here in the great hardship, to provide for hope here in the great hardship, 
to provide for a communion of saints and a kingdom of God that cannot end here in the great hardship. Thanks be to God for the language of love. May we learn to speak it well.